you for your son Jesus. We lift his name high that you would draw all men to you. Oh, we give you all the glory to you. Thank you, Jesus. Come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is a one. Children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. Come on. So don't, don't let your heart be broken.
precious name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you that you're here. I thank you that we can celebrate your goodness in our life. I thank you for your love in our hearts. Father, I thank you for your word that guides and leads us. But most of all, Father, I thank you that you gave us a family called the church. But Father, in the middle of us being so different, Father, we love you and you make us one. And so I just thank you today, Father, that we would be different than the world that we live in. Where the world responds in hate, we respond in love. Where the world is in crisis, we're in peace. Where the world is dark, we're a bright light. God, I pray today that we as a church stand on our feet and be the body of Christ in the world that we live in. That, Father, we will not shrink back. We will not mute our voices. For, Father, this is the day, this is the hour for us to shine like never before. And I just thank you for that courage and boldness in us. And we just ask you to take your word. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to apply it to our life today. In Jesus' name. If you hear that, say amen. amen. Come on, y'all. Let's give God some Woo! praise this morning. So come on, you know better than that. Hi, right, hi, right, hi. Right. Good to see you. Well, welcome those who are online. Glad welcome those who are here in person with us. What we'd love for you to do, turn around, make somebody feel welcome to hear you. Then you can take your seats. What's up, City Point? My name is Steven, and man, I'm super excited about that Lionheart event coming up. But before I get ahead of myself, welcome to all of you who are either visiting or watching for the first time. If you'd like to learn more about City Point and what we're all about, text the word WELCOME to 972-460-9235. You'll receive a little form from us, and once you fill it out, our team will connect with you and answer any questions you might have. All right, now back to that teaser. I don't want to give away too much right now, but we're having a Lionheart men's tailgate here at the church on Friday, October 23rd at 7 p.m. We'll have more details for you next week. So just go ahead and clear your schedule for that Friday night so you don't miss out. All right, I've gone on long enough. Let's continue the service and get ready for Pastor Eddie and the word he's bringing to you in week four of our September series, Align. on the series Align, and we've been talking about several things. Before I jump into that, I do want to mention just a couple things. Number one, the team night is tonight. Uh, for those who currently serve or you're interested in serving, we invite you out. I know it's tough to get back out on a Sunday, but we'd love to see you here. We want to talk about this fall, and we have a message. Actually, it's a guest speaker uh, that has something to say to us, and I think will encourage us um, and strengthen all of us. So I encourage you. It's worth the trip. It's about an hour and a half. Uh, we're going to have child care for those who have children that need care, and we will care for your children. So uh, that was, okay, that was, I thought that was funny. So um, anyway, we'd love for you to be out here. Uh, next thing is on the 18th of uh, October, which is next month, middle of the month, we're going to have an encounter night. And I can't wait. We also have a, we have a, we have a special guest live and in person who's going to share a word with us. And it's a gift that God talks about in Scripture that he says not only benefits the saints, but also the sinners. And I'll talk to you more about that in the month of October in that series. But really just to utilize the tools that God has given us for days like this. And I can't wait for you to be part of it. So make sure you clear your calendar for uh, the 18th. And as Stephen mentioned in the video, 
which is kind of an epic opener. I was like, I feel like I need to have an ax or something while I'm talking about the men's thing. But we're going to have a great night. It's going to be a worship word, and then we're going to have a chili cook-off afterwards. So I encourage you, men, come on out. Wives, if your husband don't want to come, just lock them out of the house. Tell them they can't come home. Till they get, and then you can, I'll tell you what questions to ask them to make sure they came. So, uh, but we'd love for everybody to be here and be a part of it. It's going to be a great night. We're unable to do our men's retreat, so that's why we're doing this event. Uh, so in our Align series, we've been talking about aligning our politics, about our priorities and our hope. And today we're going to talk about aligning our influences. And this message, I, I hope, really helps some people um, because I want to reveal, show something to you that I don't think the enemy wants us to notice. And influence is this. It's to have an effect on the character, the development, the behavior of someone or something uh, or the effect itself. And so influence something is powerful. It, it's also subtle. It can lead us in life without us not even being aware of it. We feel it everywhere in what we do. Uh, companies spend millions of dollars researching how to influence you to buy their products. And all of us have product preferences right now that we haven't even tried the other product. We just think that product is better. And it's because they've influenced us to think that. We also see this a darker side. We see People in, uh, whether entertainment or politics, can influence our, the morality of our nation, where all of a sudden it can be influenced for good or it can be influenced for bad. There's ideas that are normalized and ideas that are criticized that we can call good evil and evil good. All of that comes through the power of influence. Influence affects our decisions, affects our morality, affects our values, affects our politics, and sometimes even our faith, which is what I want to talk about today. And I want to just mention something in I'm sure I won't make anybody happy with anything with parts of this, and I'm sure people can pick it apart, but with what our nation's going through right now with race and equality and justice. And I think for us as a body of Christ, that we should be different in this world. We as the body of Christ stand for righteousness in every and any situation. For, the, for those that are hurt and wounded and mistreated, we stand with them and say that's not God's best. That's not what God desires. In fact, the Christian faith, if you look back through its history, when the, with the Jewish people were persecuted and mistreated, the Christians, the New Testament, our, our peers basically were mistreated and punished for their faith. And so God understands what that is, and God has always been one to lift people, right? But then also as Christians, we're on the other side of the fence where we believe in supporting our authorities and those who have put their life in harm's way for us. We as Christians cannot afford to be influenced by this world. What we can do is stand up and be God's voice of righteousness and love and peace in the world that we live in. To say there is a right way to navigate this situation. And my prayer is, is that the church stop being silent. I know it's scary to talk about this stuff. I'm nervous right now saying this to you. And pastors, in fact, all over the nation are scared. How, how do we talk about it without offending everybody? I can tell you what it is. It's number one, we just have to look at the word of God as the foundation of how we treat any topic. And where it lines up with the Word of God, we support it. Where it doesn't line up with the Word of God, we don't support it. And I tell you right now, church, we've got to learn how to be a light in this difficult topic in people's lives. Shut down the offense and say, listen, we stand for righteousness. We stand for love. And we want righteousness and we want love regardless of race, creed, job, or title. We believe that's what God has for the body of Christ. Amen. And so I just... I know it's a tough thing, and I'm not saying go out there and kick up conversations, but when that comes up, don't allow what's going on in our culture to influence you into thinking that you have to pick a side. Our side is God's side. Our side is righteousness. Our side is love. And so be that voice in the world that we live in. It's not a voice that's heard very much anymore in the world that we live in. So with influence, the power of it is this, is that it puts an idea in your head that you feel is authentic to you. And so you start living out of the, what's been influenced into your life without even being aware of it. It becomes a, 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 a place of leadership in your life, and you, you're unaware that you've given it that place. Scripture tells us that there is a master of influence. In fact, he's so masterful at influence, he got one-third of the angels to rebel against God to follow his rebellion. And he did that through the power of his influence. And if you thought that he stopped then with his influence, you're deceived because his influence is just alive today in our life as it was then. So let me pray over you and we'll jump into this. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and I just thank you for your love. I thank you for your power, God. I thank you um, for this opportunity for us to be who you called us to be. God, I pray that we won't back down from it. Father, we won't politicize it. For Father, your word is bigger than politics. Your word is bigger than hate. 
your power is stronger than all the things that we feel pulling against us in this world. And I pray that, Father, we as believers identify where the enemy has tried to influence our life and influence our thinking, and we reject it, and we stand with you, and we stand with your word, and we stand with your body like you've designed us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so let's, let's jump into this. We're going to kick off in Genesis 3 where the enemy first shows his hand and really reveals to us as human beings what he looks like and what his plan is for our life. And so it's in Genesis 3.1. It says this, the serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. Scripture starts off right off the bat to say this guy was a tricky one. You, you, he was somebody that you were always nervous about because you never know what his motives are because he always said one thing and he did another. And he spoke to the woman. He says, do I understand that God has told you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? He knew right off the bat that was not a lie, but he told this lie to get her into another line. This is how he begins to work. This was, this was the enemy. This was a supernatural being that a mortal woman was having a conversation with. Now, in the garden, that was normal. Nowadays, if our animals talk back to us, now, a lot of us talk to our dogs. I talk to our dog all the time. And what, if she ever came back and said, you know what, Eddie, you're stupid too. Like, that, then I would be like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, like, anyway, I'm just saying, in that world, when the supernatural and the supernatural mingled, this was not unusual. And so he questions her, and verse 2 says this, The woman said to the serpent, Not at all. We can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only the tree in the middle of the garden that God said do not eat from it, and don't even touch it, don't even touch it, or you'll die. Now, the serpent came along, and he says, Well, here it is. He goes, You're not going to die. He goes, That's really a, it's an ex exaggeration. It's really an overstatement. God kind of did some overkill there. He really didn't mean that. Verse 5, God knows that the moment you eat that tree, this is what's going to happen. You're really going to see what's going on. He says what he's afraid of is you'll be just like him, that you'll know everything ranging from good to evil. In other words, he goes, y'all's ability to see life clearly will be equal at that point. See, God wants to keep you down. He, he really wants to kind of keep you under his thumb. But if you eat this fruit, you're going to be elevated, and you're going to be like God in, in the fact that you can make decisions for yourself just as good as he can. And so this is where the influence begins to start. He says God doesn't know what's best for you. You know what's best for you. He says, just don't listen to God. I, I'm not trying to lead you. I'm just saying you don't have to follow all of his ideas. You can still follow him, but just not all of his ideas. He says, you're going to be missing out. And, and, and on, honestly, this is where his influence begins to see, and you begin to see where he's leading her. Now, this is what the devil does. Verse 6, the enemy will sell you the opportunity, but not tell you about the cost. And anytime the enemy wants to influence you in a direction, he will tell you the opportunity. Oh, you need to say this. You need to do this. You need to live this way. But he won't tell you about the price that you're going to have to pay to live that way. Verse 6. When the woman saw the tree look, good, uh, look like good eating and realized that what she would get out of it, that she would know everything, she took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband, and he ate it. Now, both of the, that moment that she listened to the enemy's influence is also the moment that she stopped following God. Now, the enemy never said, I want to lead you. He just said, I simply want to influence you. But what he understands, as soon as God is not in the lead anymore, he's not, God, he's not the Lord in, anymore in that area. And so that's what he did. Immediately, verse 7, uh, the two of them did see what's really going on. They saw themselves naked. They saw the fig leaves, sewed fig leaves together to make a makeshift clothes for themselves. That moment, they instantly stepped out of, God's, out of that covering. And instantly, they stopped seeing themselves the way that God saw them as covered and they saw themselves the way they truly were, and that was naked. This is what the enemy does, is he wants to remove God's perspective of who you are out of your life. And if he can influence you to that place to no longer see what God sees, then all of a sudden he'll get you to do what you want to do, not what God wants to do for your life. See, this is the truth about God. He never planned on being an influence in their life. And God has never planned on being an influence in your life. That is not the role that he wants to be an influencer in your life. He wants to be the Lord of your life. He wants to lead your life. He wants to say, listen, if you trust me, I'll take you where you need to go. But the idea that I'm going to sit beside you and whisper ideas into your ear that you can pick and choose, he goes, I will not be that. He goes, I will be everything or I will be nothing. And so that's where the enemy wants us to push God into this place where he's just an influence. And you say, well, well I think God is just loving and God doesn't really care. He just wants us happy. That's not in the Bible. God is love, but it is love like this. Scripture used in the New Testament, Ephesians 5, it, it looks at our relationship with God like a marriage. And so a husband and a wife. 
Now, let's say within a marriage that, one, that both people, you know, they're married, they're in love. One of the people, are just, they're doing their very best in the marriage. If the other one steps out and has infidelity, has, commits adultery. Does that person still love that one that hurt them? Absolutely. But does that person necessarily trust that person or want to be in that relationship? Well, it really depends whether that person can repent and have that marriage restored or that person, that relationship separates. But in the middle of that, there's still love that was in that relationship. God loves us, but that does not mean he just takes everything that we give to him. He says, I love you because I love you. I want to do what's best for you. Now, what the enemy does in this life is, is he understands that he wants to influence our life so that we are influenced away from God's leadership in our life. Influence says this. This is what the enemy does. He says, choose what's good for you. Influence says, do what's right for you. God says, follow me and trust me. And those are big differences. The enemy really is, is, is his power position is not in leading you. If the enemy's goal was to lead your life, none of us would fall for it. If he says, hey, I want you to be a Satan worshiper. I want you to crucify a goat on the weekend and get a pentagram on your forehead. I want you to drink chicken blood. Like whatever that is. Not that you're like, that's not what they do, Eddie. I don't care. I'm just saying. If, if that was his power position. If that was his thing to say, listen, I want you to be a worshiper of me, he knows that the vast majority of people would not do that because it's way too transparent. What did he do with Adam and Eve? Did he say, come worship me? He said, no. He says, God just doesn't know how to take care of you like you know how to take care of you. And that was his power. That was his influence. And since that day, the enemy has been walking into our life saying, listen, God really doesn't know what's best. You know what's best for you. Do what works for you. And if it happens to coexist with God's plan, super. But you're not hurting God and you're not hurting yourself to live under the influence of somebody else. See, his move is always influencing. That's why you hear these things in your heart like, did God really say that? Did God really mean that? I mean, it, it, it's, but it's, it may be the wrong thing to do, but it feels right to me. Is it, if you do it, it's not going to hurt you. That's the enemy's influence in our life. His goal is to take us from God leadership to self-leadership in areas in our life. He's not trying to get you to be a devil worshiper. He's just trying to let you be in the power position like Eve put herself in that situation to self-leadership. If we want God to be an influence, what we're saying is, I know best, and I appreciate your advice on this situation. And God says, that's not who I want to be in your life. So today I want to share three strategies that he used in the life of Jesus that I think that we can learn from. Now, we have to understand this. From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, the enemy was trying to influence Jesus out of his purpose. And so we first really see this clearly uh, in, his, in the early days of his ministry where the Holy Spirit led Jesus to a place of testing. And it was also a place of fasting. So he fasted for 40 days in 40 nights. Um, if I did that, I would not be around anymore. I, I don't know how he did that. That was God's grace working in him, God's power. So the enemy did not tempt Jesus in these scriptures to like, hey, let's go to Mardi Gras. He didn't tempt Jesus to say, hey, let's, uh, let's go rob a bank. No, he tempted Jesus along the lines of his purpose and to shift and influence him off of what God had for him. So let's look at it. Matthew 4, 3. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, Tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He says, The first thing, he goes, Listen, he goes, If you really are the Son of God, I mean, if you are, then, then use what you have to, to, for you. In other words, he says, Make it about you, Jesus. I mean, forget the needs, forget everything else going on, forget what God's doing. He says, Make it, let's, let's be selfish. Well, how can we make your faith serve you? That was his first temptation. Then verse 5, it says, The devil took him to the holy city and took him and stayed him on the highest point of the temple. He says, If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone, which is a scripture. And Jesus said, I, It is also written, Do not put your Lord your God to the test. In other words, the next temptation was, listen, let me try to do this. Let me move you to a more of a, a reckless place with God's grace. If God's going to forgive you anyway, if God's going to redeem you anyway, why not just push the boundaries of that? 
And this is the next thing that I think the enemy tries to position us, is he tries to live, get us to live on the edges of where God has for us. Because he knows if he can get us on the edge of it and abuse it, that one day we'll fall off that edge and hurt our own lives. But that was his influence. He didn't say, listen, I want you to abuse God's grace. I want you to abuse his goodness. He just said, let me pull you to a line, and let me see if I can push you over that line. Then the next thing he says, um, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. He says, all of this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and they attended to him. His last temptation was worship, a changing of his affections, to move what belonged to God to the enemy himself. To put something else first. Worship, biblically, is not just a song. What we did just a few minutes ago, yes, that is worship. But worship has always been bigger than just a handful of songs. Worship is a way a person lives their life. They live a worshipful life. And what the enemy was saying is he says, listen, I just need you to change your influences. I need you to shift your priorities. If you worship what I say worship and you put the things that I say important before the other things, he says, I can get you everything. He says, it's going to be easier this way. It's going to be a shortcut for you. And this is where I think the enemy works in our life. This is the first voice that we often hear in our life. It's a voice of deception. It's a voice that takes a truth and twists the truth just slightly enough that it takes you off the path that God has for you. What did he do with Eve? Did he say that he deceived her? He said, this is, no, no, God didn't mean that. And the very first influence that we see in her life is that he wanted to take Jesus, wanted to use his, be selfish or use God's grace or, or deprioritize God. His baseline was that he, I just don't want you doing what God says the way God says to do it. You can still do it, but just in a different way. And this is it. This is what the enemy, and this is what this influence looks like in our life. We look for shortcuts. We take a shortcut. We say, I know what Scripture says. I know what the Bible says. But this just seems easier than that. And I don't really think that God cares if I do it this way or not. And as long as the enemy can influence us to take a shortcut, no matter what that shortcut looks like, because that shortcut was intended by God to lead us to a place of trust. And if we take the shortcut, we go out of that place of trust and we go into trusting ourselves. But this is what Scripture would say. Instead of taking a shortcut in those places in your life, you take a stand. You take a stand. You say, you know what? Yeah, I, I may need to sacrifice at this point in my life, but I'm willing to do it to obey God. Yes, church is a sacrifice. Yes, we are really busy right now. Yes, you know, our kids have a busier schedule than an NFL football player playing, you know, in their sport league right now. Like, we need a jet just to fly us around to our events for our kids' sports, but we're going to be in the house of God, right? Like, it, it, it's literally, I understand that, that many of y'all on a Sunday morning, you had a long work week. This week is beating you up. And then all of a sudden, when that alarm goes off on Sunday, you have two choices. Either you go, yeah, we're going to go, or yeah, God doesn't care. And I think for many times in our life, what the enemy wants us to do is to keep pushing us off of the center of what God said because simply God said it. That's why we do it. And the enemy's influence is this, not to say that God is dead and God isn't real and the Bible isn't real and all that. He simply says God doesn't really mean what he says, so you can really do what's best for you. And when we live that way, all of a sudden we open our life up to his deception. The next thing is this, it's the next influence was in Matthew 16. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of his elders and the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. That he would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. Now, this Jesus began to tell them plainly. Now, before he was talking cryptically about what would happen, but now he just comes out and tells them the plain truth. And Peter took him aside and began to reprimand Jesus, saying such things, Heaven forbid, Lord. He said, This will never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and he said, Get away from me, Satan. He says, You are a dangerous trap to me. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Now, Peter in this situation, he is not the devil, nor is he devil to possess. Verse uh, 24 doesn't say, then Jesus grabbed Peter by the head and exercised the demon outside of him, and his head spun around three times and, and a great roar, you know, like, no. He looked at Peter, and he says, you are not under my influence right now. There is an influence that you're speaking right now that is not from God. In fact, that influence is dangerous to the purposes of God in my life. And Jesus recognized, it's not that 
Peter was trying to knock and say, no, 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 you're, you're not the Messiah. He's just simply saying you can be the Messiah but not have to go through all that. And this is where the enemy is very sneaky in our life is that he uses good people sometimes to influence us to do the wrong thing. Some of the worst decisions I've made in my life have been with other Christians. True. I've said things, thought things, gone places that I just think, man, you know, you, you're, you're like, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did, because it's another Christian. And I think for all of us in this room, what we have to understand is that the enemy knows how to get to you. And he's not going to send a stranger sometimes in your life. Sometimes he's going to plant somebody who's going to tell you things that are dangerous for you. And that's what Peter represented. He represented an influence that was dangerous to Jesus. And if we don't recognize the dangerous things to our future, we can jeopardize the future and the things that God has for us simply because we allow ourselves to be continually and perpetually influenced that pushes us away from the steps we need to take to be who God's called us to be. Where did Adam get the fruit? From his wife, Eve. There were only two believers and two God's children in the entire place, and they took each other down. We have to be on guard in our life. Did Peter say no to God's plan? No. He just told Jesus sacrifice doesn't have to be a part of it. But here's the truth about sacrifice. It advances God's kingdom. More often than not, God will use a place of sacrifice to open up something in your heart, in your life, or in a church, or whatever. We have to be willing to face those moments with strength. So this is the second voice, I would say, of second place of influence. It's really the voice of distraction. It's a voice of distraction. That in the middle of it, 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 this is probably one of the most dangerous voices in our life because it's the easiest to listen to because more often than not, it's in sync with our flesh. Scripture tells us that Jesus' flesh did not want to die on that cross, but he knew that he needed to die on that cross for us. So often in our life that it, we, we feel like that, that we don't want to pay that price. Sometimes it's, it's telling ourselves no. Sometimes it's not cutting a corner. Sometimes the enemy comes along and he just says, you know, you can have it all. God's cool. You don't have to stand that way. You don't have to do that. But anytime we can clear, read a clear direction in God's word about how he wants us to behave and we're willing to dismiss it, we are under the enemy's influence in that area in our life. And I think we'd be better off to recognize his influence in our life and say, listen, I've listened to some lies and I'm working back towards the truth in this area than to defend the lie that we're living by. Y'all are quiet this morning. Because, you know, honestly, I don't really care who you are. Whether you've served Jesus one year or a hundred years, you, if you're rich or poor, young or old, you can be influenced by the enemy. I can be influenced by the enemy. I still feel his influence every day in my life. I still feel him trying to push things away and push things in. And I have to be cognizant of it. I have to be aware of it in my life. So this is it. The enemy's influence is this. Draw back from sacrifice. If it looks like it's going to cost you, if it looks like you're going to have to work hard for it, if it looks like you're going to have to forgive, if it looks like you're going to have to give, if it looks like you're going to have to serve, if it looks like you're going to have to love or be generous or, or choose God, he goes, just back away from it. That's not God's plan. God wants to make it super easy and no sacrifice is involved. And anytime the enemy is influencing you away from a place of sacrifice, you can guarantee that that sacrifice is, is intricately part of your future and the plans that God has for you. Because the enemy's going to stand in your life and tell you, no, it's not worth it. You don't have to do it. Husband, don't put your wife first. Put your friends first. Whatever that lie is, he'll get in your marriage. He'll get in the way you raise your kids. He'll wait, look, if you're looking for a mate, he'll just say, just date anybody. You know, maybe they aren't a Christian, but maybe they can be a Christian late. Yeah, he just lies. And he understands if he can get you to draw back from that place, he can draw you into a place where the, God's leadership isn't present. But this is how Jesus responded, verse 24. He says, if any of you wants to be my follower, he goes, you must turn from your selfish ways and take up your cross and follow me. He goes, it's not going to be taken from you. It's going to be given from you. God's not going to take anything from you, but God wants you to surrender things to him. Jesus says, I'm going to lead you and not influence you. You've got to learn to carry your cross just like me. So Jesus would say this, if the enemy's plan is influence is to draw back from sacrifice, Jesus says, choose to be led into a place of sacrifice. In all of our lives, and our, all of our sacrifice looks different. For me, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a Christian, all of them require me to sacrifice at different levels. Yesterday, Julie, my Julie loves the fair. And so they canceled the fair because of COVID this year, which is a crime against humanity, right? And so 
I said, well, I want to take Julie to the fair. So I found online where they're doing drive through fair. Sounds easy. Sounds simple, right? Four hours later when we ate our kid, kid corn dog, it wasn't that easy. Like we got in, they suck you in, you just turn in there, and then you're in this chain of cars for hours with no hope of getting out with a porta potty every 30 feet. And you're just sitting there thinking, I hope the gas lasts. Like I told you, I, mean, I would have eaten breakfast and lunch and dinner before we came if I knew this is longer we're going to be sitting. And, and then you get in there, you get a cotton candy and a corn dog, and you're like, thank you, and you just drive back home. Anyway. If that happens next year, I'll buy Julie and her friends some. I'm not going anymore. So um, we all choose to sacrifice. It's part of who we are as the children of God. And the enemy always is blowing that wind into our life. You can have it all. God, it doesn't take all that. Now, the last influence that I want us to pay attention to is the this very last thing that the enemy did to Jesus there on the cross. Now, I want you to notice this about Jesus' ministry, that it happened at the beginning of his ministry, it happened in the middle of his ministry. It happened at the end of his ministry. You have to recognize this. The enemy is never going to stop trying to influence you. He'll change what he influences, but he will never stop trying to influence you. When you're single, he wants to influence you a direction. When you're married, he wants to influence you in a direction. When you have kids, he wants to influence you. When you go to church, he wants to influence you. When you don't go to church, he wants to. He never quits. He never gives up. His goal is to destroy what God loves. And if you want to look at the enemy's plan for our nation, you can look at it right now with the hate that he's trying to grow and divide people. Jesus said, if you're divided, you will not stand. And the enemy loves to divide and he loves to separate and he loves to influence because nobody says he's leading it, but his breath and his fingerprints is all over the things that, that hurt us so much in life. And so this is, we're going to catch up here with Jesus. This is his very last moments of his life uh, on earth. He was uh, led through a mistrial. He was led through a trial that was kind of, he was railroaded. Then he was beaten. Uh, his beard was torn out. He was beaten with a cat of nine tails. His back was laid open. He was stripped naked, mocked by Roman soldiers. Then he took up his cross, dragged it up to a hill called Golgotha until he fell and somebody had to help carry it the rest of the way. Once they got his body that was already broken onto that cross, they laid him on that cross, put spikes through his arms and through his feet that he had to push up on to breathe. He was swollen and bleeding and tortured and dying. Now, most people with mercy, even if that was the most hated person in your life, would stop and think, I have done enough to them. I need to leave them alone. It's one thing when you hate somebody, but when something bad happens to somebody that you hate, all of a sudden you begin to have mercy on that person, not the enemy. See, when I, when I went to the hospital, the enemy didn't stop because I was dying on my bed. He kept talking to me. And I'll tell you right now, the enemy will never shut up. You get a divorce and, and, and all those things, and you let your mar and your marriage does this, and your kids do this, and your business does this. He, he doesn't care what he destroys. All he cares is that he destroys your life through his influence. Because then one day you'll look back on it and you'll say, well, I, it was me. I made these bad decisions. You were influenced by an enemy that sowed destruction into your life, but we never saw him clearly enough to reject his influence. And my goal today, my prayer today, is that the Holy Spirit reveal to you where the enemy's influencing your life right now so you can shut that door and say, no longer am I going to take that fruit. I'm going to leave it where God says. I'm going to let God be the leader of my life in this area in my life. Because what we're about to see is the enemy just never quits. Matthew 27. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads, just general strangers walking by, looking at Jesus and saying this, you, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. They begin to mock him. They say, oh, if your faith is so powerful, if you're such a good Christian, then why are you doing this? It, why, you can't even save yourself. You know, if you're such a good Christian, why is this happening to you, Jesus? Why don't you get off that cross if, if you really are who you say you are? We've all had that experience where maybe we'll pray for somebody who needs something. You're like, well, I haven't been feeling good, and, and I just you know, really need a financial miracle. And so you pray for them, and their body gets healed. You know, they're bald. Their hair starts to grow. They win the lottery. They get promoted at work. You know, like everything just turns up wonderful. And then you pray for a headache, and you get, your headache gets worse, and you throw up. Like it's just, you just all of a sudden like, God, I don't understand why it's working for them, but it's not working for me. And that's the influence of the enemy, and that's what he was telling Jesus. He says, listen, if you really are the son of God, your circumstances should be a lot better than they are right now. What you're going through is proof that you're not who you say you are. 
And that's the influence of the enemy that says, oh, well, you're going through that. That's because you don't, you're not who you think you are. You're not the child of God. God's not going to support you. God's not going to strengthen you. But the enemy doesn't quit there. In the same way, he had another set of people come by. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked. He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. The enemy comes along and just says, listen, if you really are what you say you are, then why, don't you, why isn't this happening in your life? If you really are who you say you are, why are you going through this? In other words, he says, give me proof of, of who you are. And there's times and moments in our life where we stand upon the promises of what God says, but we have no evidence to back that thing up. It's Hebrews 11.1 1 that says the evidence of the things we hope for is the faith that we have. And there are moments where there's an end when you're standing in that place of believing for something that you can't tangibly touch or make happen. When the enemy comes along and says, if it was really going to happen, it would have happened by now. And if you really could, you already would have. So it's not going to happen. You need to give up. The enemy's goal for Jesus at this point is that at that cross, at that crucible moment in his life, he would stop and give up and say, I have failed and I'm not going through with this. He was trying to get him off of that cross. All of them were pushing them, get off the cross, get off the cross, get off the cross. Why? Because if he got off the cross, he would fail at his mission to reach and save people. And the enemy is always coming along with his influence trying to get you off the cross. To get you to back down from the things that you know really, really matter in your family and in your faith and in your nation and in the people that you love. Because it's not working. It's not working the way you thought it would work. If it was, if it was really going to happen, it would have happened by now. Why are your kids acting like this? You know, having kids, it's, it's, we, we can all get kids here. It's just once they get here, what do you do with them, right? Like, you just don't, like, I remember when our three kids, like, they, their big test for us was, can you get them in the car? Like, that was... That was it. If you can get them in the car, you can have them. And so I remember, like, we, we did, like, car seat checks and, like, how to do it. And, and they're like, there you go. Just take that human being and do whatever you want with them. And, and I remember just getting home, and we just would stare at the girls. Maddie, when she was first born, like, what do we do? She'd make a noise. She'd be like, oh, what was that? Like, you know, like, speak to us, little one. Tell us what to do, you know. And, and then the girls were just so wonderful. They wore us out. So we didn't have kids for nine years. And, uh. And then we decided to have Hudson, which was kind of a just, they were like, hey, we'll just see what happens. And a little dude came along. And I remember our first doctor's visit we went to, we were kind of out of practice as parents. And so we went into the visit, and everybody else brought their babies in the car seat, and, and we just carried Hudson in. And then we were so tired that all Julie packed was a baggie with a snot sucker in it, and that was it. No diaper bag, just a baby and a baggie and a snot sucker. And so we go in there, and... and uh, and, and they lay Hudson down, and they pull back his diaper, and little boys, when that happens, it's like Old Faithful goes off. And, and so he just peed all over the cell. It was like a little storm in there. And, and so they're like, okay, Miss Woods, can we have a diaper? And I remember Julie made eye contact with me like, I didn't bring one. And I was like, <laughs> you didn't bring one? She goes, and she just held up the baggie with the snot sucker. I'm like, what, are we just going to suck it all up? Like, what? <laughs> and so... We became the, 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 doc, the pediatrician's project. They walked around door to door. Um, excuse me, do y'all have a diaper for a newborn? We have a couple that doesn't have one, you know. And, and I remember the nurse came in. She goes, oh, is this your first one? And we're like, no, it's our third. We're just really, really bad at it, you know. And I remember we got the, the, the stroller out. And it was new. Like, it, a lot happens in that technology in nine years. And the old one, I'd have to, like, hold these two buttons, and I'd fold it. Like, it's kind of, like, mainly to do. And this one just has, like, this little button. And I remember I pulled it out of the car, and Julie's getting Hudson ready, and I'm thinking, she cannot see me not be able to operate a stroller. So I'm just shaking it really hard. And this lady's pushing a stroller. She just walks by. She goes, sir, it's this button. And she just punches it, and it unfolds. Anyway, so like I said, being a parent's not always easy, and sometimes you just don't know what you're doing. And the enemy comes along, and he tells us, you're not smart enough to do what God's called you to do. You're not eloquent enough. You're not gifted enough. You're too ugly, right? You're too smart. You're too whatever. And he wants to talk you off of the cross. Verse 43 says, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And then the final insult to it all was verse 44. The crowd, the Pharisees, and now the criminals hanging next to Jesus 
It says, in the same way, the same voice. Quit, give up, you failed, prove yourself. If you really are what you say you are, it should be happening by now. That same way, the rebels who were crucified with him heap insults on him. In Jesus' very last moments in his earthly body, in that earthly form, the enemy still did not give up trying to influence Jesus out of what God has called him to do. We have a spiritual battle on our hands that most of us, most of the time, are blind to. We think it's just our thought life, but it's an enemy trying to move move us off of God's leadership in our life to move to a place of self-leadership where we interpret God's word according to what's best for us, not interpret God's word what's best for us. And the enemy will never give up. The enemy wanted to destroy Jesus' confidence in what he was doing. And the enemy to this day is still trying to convince us that what we're doing is not going to work in our life. That there's a better way. It's just not God's way. And when the enemy comes and speaks that influence in our life, this is the voice he typically uses. It's the voice of failure. You failed. You sinned too much. You made too many mistakes. You ruined your marriage. You ruined your kids. You... You ruined your business, right? You ruined your reputation. It's not going to happen. You just need to give up and walk away. Call it a day. You wouldn't be in the situation you're in. If you were were a success, you wouldn't be going through what you're going through right now. He wants to convince you and influence you that who you are, not what you did was a failure, but who you are is a failure. That maybe you had a bad day. Maybe you made a bad decision. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you had a bad business partner. Maybe you said something to your spouse that you shouldn't have said or something to your kids. And all those things you can repent and change and transform. But the enemy says it wasn't an event. It's you. You're the problem. You are a failure. God cannot use your life anymore. You might as well give up, pack it up, and stay home because the game is over. And what the enemy was trying to convince Jesus of on that cross is you're hanging there as a failure. God sent you on a mission, Jesus, but you failed at it. And all of us have been under the influence before of that voice of failure, of that influence that steps into our life and just says, you're not going to make it, so why keep trying? That's the voice of the enemy. And this is what it sounds like. It says, you're not who you think you are. You're not who you think you are. Well, what do you think you are? You're a great wife, huh? You're a great husband, great son, great pastor, great business leader. Huh? What do you, what do you think you are? Oh, you think you're going to be a mom? No, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And that lie gives him access to influence your thought life in a direction that God would never lead you to go. He'll never say, I'm in charge of this, but he'll just let the rabbits run in your life. He'll let the fire burn. That's what he says. And it may be true. It really may be true that you're not really who you think you are because you really are who God says you are. And that's the truth about your life. Sometimes they they didn't recognize Jesus, but Jesus didn't need to be recognized to be who God said he was called to be. People don't have to applaud you. You just got to be who God's called you to be. Instead of listening to the, the enemy's influence, listen to God's voice. Malachi says this, but for those who fear my name, The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. He says, you'll go free, leaping with joy like calves led out of a pasture. He says, for those who fear him, he goes, you're going to rise. You're not going to sink. You're not going to fail. If you trust in me, you're going to rise. You're going to overcome. You're going to be victorious. God's going to redeem. God's going to restore. God's going to make whole. He goes, simply if you trust in me. Ephesians puts it this way. For we are God's masterpiece the finest work of an artist the thing that he points to and he says if you want to see my talent as an artist that's it that's my masterpiece that's what I can do scripture says you are God's masterpiece he's a statement to the world of who he is and what he can do he's a statement that says I take broken things and make them whole I make broken people and make them overcomers I take the sinful and I make them righteous I take the broken marriages and make them whole. I take the broken hearts and restore them. I take the weak knees and make them strong. I take the people who are tired and I give them the strength they need. I wipe away the tears and put in joy. I make my home on the inside of people. They are my masterpiece. They are not my mistake. They may be your mistake, but they're my masterpiece. So many of us struggle with that right there, that we're God's masterpiece, that God applauds us, that God's proud of us that God's impressed by us. 
because he made us, because he loved us, because he gave everything so that you could stand on your two feet and worship him. He invested nothing, he invested everything he could to get you where you are today. And I'm telling you, church, you're his masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ. That's why we're the masterpiece. So we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. You, he was, you were designed. I just trust that the things that I walk through in my life are have a design to reach more people for him. In my darkest moments, that's what I think. Somehow, God's going to punch the enemy in the nose with what I'm going through right now. I'm going to stick around long enough to watch that fight go down. I want to see my enemy fall. Galatians 4. You're no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you're a child, God has made you his heir. He says, not only are you my child, he goes, you're my heir. You have access to everything that I have. I, I, it's yours. You want to know how to use it? I'll teach you. I, I didn't do all this just so I would have it. I did this so that I could give it to my children because I take joy in watching my children enjoy it. For those of us who have kids or are raised by good parents, you know the joy of watching your children enjoy a gift that you give them. You also know the pain of buying the wrong gift where there's like, cool, you know. But you also know that joy when you get it right, like once every 10 years, and you get that gift that makes them happy. That joy they have in their face is worth every dollar that you spend. And Scripture says that we are God's heir, that he has lined up gifts. And he says, I just want you to open them because I made you worthy to receive them. So my last point this, to outwork the enemy's influence in your life, is you are who God says you are. This is something I tell myself on a regular basis. On my low days, on my tough days, and yes, pastors have those days too, I say, I am who God says I am, and I can do what God says I can do. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. And that little simple saying has saved me for years. Because there are moments when I just want to back up and say, man, I don't think I'm who God says I am, and I don't think I can do this. And I remind myself, I am who God says I am, and I can do what God says I can do. There is nothing impossible to you in this room today. Whatever God has laid before you, you can do it, and you can overcome. There's nothing that you are under right now that you cannot get on top of. There's no hurt in your life that cannot be healed. There's nothing impossible to God. The enemy comes along in your life, and he wants to influence you that you can't trust him with his leadership, that you can only trust yourself. And that's the enemy's plan for your life, is to use his influence to stop trusting God and start trusting in yourself. Because he knows you cannot save yourself. Only God can. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for everybody that's in this room today. God, I thank you for the power of your word and of your spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for working in us. I thank you for your word that's a lamp to our feet and a, and a light to our path, God, that you guide us and lead us. You challenge us. Father, I just pray for those in this room that are under the influence of the enemy in an area in their life. I pray that, Father, that is revealed today, that it is exposed. And that, Father, we reject the enemy's influence in our life. We reject the voices of failing. We reject the voices of distraction. We reject these voices of failure, God, in our life. And we just say, your will will be done. And Father, I just come against oppression and anxiety and fear and all the side effects of the enemy's influence. And I command that to go in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that we're free, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And so, Father, I thank you today for giving us light in our dark areas. And Father, we move our influence, Father, from influence to your leadership. In Jesus' name, amen. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with God, but you say, today, Eddie, I would like to begin that relationship or even renew my relationship, whether you're online or here in person with us, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you say, today, I would like to begin my relationship with God or renew it, I'm going to pray a prayer with everybody in this room. If you say, hey, please include me in that prayer, can you raise your hand real fast, Sang Su, who I'm praying with this morning? Sang Su, who it is today? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. That's awesome. Let's say this prayer with those who raise their hands, whether online or in person. Just say this after me, everybody. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. 
Thank you for saving me. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Fill me with all that you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's give God praise for those that made that decision today. Um, if you made that decision, we want to celebrate with you. Text uh, the number on the screen. It's also on our Next Step card. I don't have one here with me. Uh, it's in the back of your chair. It says Next Step. Go on the second line. It tells you the decision. Text the word decision to that number online. That screen, that number is also there. We'd love to hear that from you and celebrate with you. We're not done yet. I want to do a couple things before we go today. I want to remind you all that on uh, October the 4th, we receive our Heart for the House offering. Our Heart for the House offering is going to accomplish two things. One, it's going to help replace mics where the frequencies have been sold. And actually, June was the expiration date of that, so we need to get moving on this. Uh, that's We planned it earlier in March, but COVID hit, so we didn't receive this offering. Second part is to help us with our online church experience. There's still equipment we need to buy and purchase to, be, to make that happen. And so the total we're shooting for is $42,000. And all I'm simply asking you to do is just pray about what you can give. This is over and above your normal tithe, over and above what you normally give. This is a seed offering, basically. 2 Corinthians 9 is a chapter, that, a good bit about giving. It says this, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. I believe all of us have seed. Some of us have it in our savings account. Some of us have it in our checking account. Some of us are going to get a check from work, a bonus or whatever. And God will say, hey, that's seed. Whatever that seed is, the scripture says we just sow that. And that's all I'm asking you to do is say, God, what seed do I have and how can I give it? For some, it'll be a, a figure that you never even dreamed about giving before. For some, it'll be something that you've already have it in your heart. Regardless of what it is, follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in this area and you won't regret it. And then also we're going to receive our normal tithe and offering this morning. Proverbs 3, 9 says, On the Lord with your wealth with the best part of everything you produce. Um, I'm going to pray. Uh, we will not be passing a bucket. We have uh, offering boxes on both sides of the sound booth and in this little hall if you want to give it in person. Or you can just throw it in the air and we'll come around and collect it later. We don't really care. Uh, you can give by text or online, however you want to do it. We're just grateful for your honoring God and worshiping God with what he blessed you with. It's part of a lifestyle of worship. So let me pray over our giving. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to give. And we worship you with what you blessed us with. And I just thank you today as we give. That Father, I thank you that you'll bless what remains in our hands. That Father, you are faithful. And I thank you that we'll be good stewards as a church. That Father, we'll be good stewards as individuals. But Father, it's not ours. We're simply managers of what you bless us with. In Jesus' name, amen. The uh, last thing we're going to do today is we want to honor the teachers among us. Proverbs 22, 6 says this, start off a child on the way they should go. When they're old, they will not depart from it. The teachers stand as a very unique role in the lives of those of us with children. Uh, I remember that some of the teachers that had big influences on my life. And I know for those who teach in public school, your ability to bring your faith into the classroom is very limited. But I think what's not limited is who you are as a light in a dark world. I know what's not limited is the, the, the presence of God that you bring into that classroom. I know what's not limited is when a child with a broken heart talks to you, your ability to not only educate that child, but minister to that child wherever you're at. And so we value what our teachers do. I know it's been a stressful season for y'all. As a recipient of, uh, you know, we had a kid, Hudson's done online and in person. I can only imagine the stress that you're under and do that. So we as a church just simply want to say, hey, you're doing a great job. We're here for you. We're praying for you. And so if you're a teacher here in the house this morning, can you just stand? And we want to just acknowledge you and honor you this morning. Just please stand right where you're at. Come on, guys. All right. Thank you for what you do. And... Uh, we're just going to pray for you real quick. Uh, you can remain standing. Hold on. We're not done. We're not done. I, I get to do to you what you do to the kids, right? I make you stand up. I need an answer in the back, please. Uh, my third point was, uh, anyway, so let's, uh, I want to pray for y'all. So just stretch your hands towards them. Let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, I thank you today uh, for these wonderful people standing among us, Father, who give their life to the education of children. Father, you said these children's angel is always before you. And Father, they're precious in your sight. And I just pray, Father, for these educators, Lord, that your grace would be on them. That, Father, during this stressful time, that, Father, they'll find peace in you. And, Father, not only that, they would bring that peace into the classroom. That, God, you would use them in the lives of these children. Lord, I pray that you would protect their homes and protect their families, Father, from any sickness or disease. God, that you would watch over them. And we just pray your blessing upon them for what they do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's give a big more hand. Now you can take your seats. Uh, we have a gift for you. Uh, 
uh, it's in the back of the auditorium. It's my left, your right. It's this outside wall here. It's our information booth. Stop by there. Tell them you're a teacher. Uh, they, they're not going to need documentation or anything. They just, if you say it, we believe it because it's church, right? And so we want to give that to you. You say, well, I don't know if I want a gift. Stop it. Take the gift. We bought it already. So just take it, please. Um, we don't want it back. So take it. It's not much anyway. We just simply want to say thank you. So anyway, I, we're going to continue this next week. I hope this blessed you this morning. And I pray that, that really the enemy has lost his influence in your life in the areas that you'll see it more clearly than ever before. So, Andrew. Let's give it up for Pastor Eddie. That was an amazing message. That was awesome. It was great. And I just want to reiterate, if you did make a decision today, whether uh, you're watching online or if you were here in person, please let us know. Uh, we'd love to celebrate with you. You can text decision to the number that's on the screen. And again, like Pastor Eddie said, there's that next step card in the front pocket. Um, feel free to text that and get connected. We, we definitely want to share with you your next step, but we also want to pray with you. And I, and I think through this message of influence, uh, we recognize that you know, it can get tough. But when it gets tough, this is why we're not all beamed up in heaven as soon as you get saved, right? We have each other. And so what I would say, and what I wanna do is invite the prayer team up uh, at this point. If you have a need, um, you know, or you, you need prayer in your life, this is why we have our prayer team up here. I actually wanna read a scripture. It says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, it says, when two of you get together on anything at all, uh, anything on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. This is Jesus talking to his disciples and he says, he guarantees two things. One, if you pray together, God's gonna start working on it. And number two, and I think it's more important, is that he's, I'm gonna be there. And maybe tonight or today, you're, you're not in a situation where you need a solution. You're in a situation where you need somebody. Like you need his presence. And I would just encourage you, man, if that's you, come up here and pray with these guys. We wanna, we wanna connect with you and we firmly believe that prayer is not an Hail Mary pass, right? And prayer works. And we believe that you'll be able to, from the moment you start praying, have the presence of God in your life. So I encourage you with that. Uh, before I let you guys go, let's all stand. A couple things. If you're new here, welcome. Make sure to stop by the Next Steps table in the Life Lobby. Get your gift from us. Also, our team member would love the opportunity to talk with you guys. And the last thing is, we've got team night tonight, which means if you serve in any capacity, that's right, it's going to be fun. Um, come, hang out with us. We're going to be inspired about the next couple months. Also, we have a great time. And if you say, well, I'm not a point team member, but I have FOMO and I really want to come, uh, hey, come hang out with us. Learn what it means to be a point team member, and we'll definitely get you plugged in. So uh, that's tonight here at the church, 5 p.m. Let me pray for you guys as we leave today. God, I thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunity to be able to come together as a family, whether it's online or in person, uh, to worship you, to hear and be encouraged by your word. Holy Spirit, I just ask that this message that's within all of us that we've heard today, let it not just be something that goes in one ear and out the other, Help us to be inspired by this message. Help, help us to be on guard against any influences of the enemy. We just thank you, God, for the opportunity to hear your word from Pastor Eddie. We, we thank you for his leadership and how you are leading him in his life. I, I thank you, God, that as we leave today as one church body, Lord, that you're influencing us, you're leading us, excuse me, uh, into your purpose. And I, and I thank you, God, for just the opportunity to come together. I thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Hey, you guys have a great rest of your Sunday. We'll see you back here tonight, 5 p.m. for Team Night. Y'all have a good one.